Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the box was cardboard, the detective was dying, and the bridge was Thor, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. Have you ever stopped to wonder why James Fillimore disappeared looking for his umbrella? Or just how Parsley can manage to sink into the butter? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 296, The Metaphysical Holmes. Well, hello there, and welcome once again to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you feeling more meta or more physical today? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a very good question. I think I'm feeling um, physically meta. I think. <laughs> Are you, well, are you feeling your oats? I guess that's the uh, the question. No, but I am a little hoarse. But I want to. But I want to tell you. <laughs> I gotta tell you, friends. I gotta tell you. Uh, what does feeling your oats mean, anyway? Well, it started. You know, it actually has a military connotation because it began, I believe, with General Mills. <laughs> oh. You're killing me here. We we better get into things before this gets worse. Um, well, friends, we have a fine episode for you today where we're going to be looking into the head and the heart of Sherlock Holmes. It's actually connected to a couple of episodes that we did before, episodes 183 and 184, where we looked at justice. Take a look at that in... Uh, season four of Trifles, episodes 183 and 184, Justice, uh, just to refamiliarize yourself with this content. And while you do that, we'll just remind you that the show notes for this episode are available at iHose.co slash Trifles 296, all lowercase. That'll take you directly to the entry at the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com website. There you can sign up for email updates and uh, to become a patron because in this episode, this is the end of the month, the end of August, we have a drawing, something we do every month. And in this case, we are doing the drawing for a free back issue of the Baker Street Journal. And if you are a Patreon supporter, that is, if you are a patron then you are automatically entered into this drawing every month. And it doesn't matter whether you support us at the $10 a month uh, level, the $1 a month level, or anything in between. All of our patrons are eligible. So stay tuned for that right after the discussion, and we will get to it. Meanwhile, just remind you that if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at trifles at ihearofsherlock.com, and we are at I Hear of Sherlock across all of the major social platforms. All right, we are looking at the metaphysical homes, and Bert, I want to give you the opportunity to discuss this because you were the inspiration. Well, the inspiration here is really David Stuart Davies, one of the great Sherlockians, and also the Sherlock Holmes magazine, which is published by our friend Adrian Brady. And I'm sure you, we will have a link in the show notes to our interview with Adrian Brady. And this comes really from the summer 2022 issue, issue number nine of the Sherlock Holmes magazine. David Stuart Davies. Uh, the playwright, scholar, Sherlockian, has a recurring column 
in the magazine called Sherlockian Scribblings. And his entry here, his essay here, That Great Heart, considers Holmes as a metaphysical detective. And it's one of those very interesting observations that we wanted to share with you because it knits together a large number of elements that we've talked about at various times in the cases of Sherlock Holmes. But it gives us, he does it in a way that gives us new insight into Holmes' choices and character. And he begins with this whole idea of metaphysics. He says in the 16th century, the school of metaphysical poets evolved. It was the age of the Renaissance man, and the poetry reflected this. And he cites John Donne, who dealt with, in his poetry, the strong emotions of either a physical or spiritual nature. And the subject matter of the poems related to the heart, while its expression appealed to and challenged the intellect. And it's that duality, the intellect and the heart, that David explores here. And he quotes John Donne's poem, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Ah, uh, good old Hemingway. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he caps it off, you know, just by pointing out, and this is sort of the key to the whole um, essay here. He says, you know, the essential message of this verse is that we're all responsible for each other. And with that responsibility comes the necessity to ensure that true justice for all is carried out. And, you know, this is fascinating to me because for all of the credit that we give Sherlock Holmes for creating this profession, and he does uh, say that outright to uh, Watson, and, you know, I am the only one in the world. It's a, a profession that uh, I've created for myself. We, we tend to think of Holmes doing this because of his acute interest in science and deductive reasoning. And I don't think we give enough thought to Holmes's view on justice. You know, we, we, we talk about justice as uh, personified, as brought to life in uh, examples as we did in episodes 183 and 184. And I think in those cases, we were, uh, we were looking at uh, the justice meted out by Holmes in um, the five orange pips, the Greek interpreter, the engineer's thumb, things uh, that that had, um, you know, uh, unfinished endings and, and how Holmes sought justice that way. And then we, we thought about disproportionate justice in episode 184, whether the outcome fit the crime in the three students, the Musgrave ritual, and the sign of four. But we don't really give much thought uh, in these discussions, to you know, Holmes as a pursuer of justice for the sake of uh, choosing this profession. In other words, did he choose the profession more because he was interested in justice or more because he was interested in the scientific method? Yeah. No, really, that's, be, that's a beautiful summary, and that's really sort of the key point of David's essay here. You know, he says, you know, everybody knows this image of Sherlock Holmes as the cold-blooded reasoner, the most perfect observing machine. You know, this comes out a lot. And then he thrives on work. You know, this great quote, of course, from Sign of Four, give me problems, give me work, give me the most abstruse cryptogram. And how he becomes depressed if he doesn't have work. But David, David echoes that point that you've just made quite well. He says, you know, it, it can't be just his desire to work that drove him into this career. There must have been a deeper, greater motive. He's, David writes, of all the areas of activity and study that could have challenged and perplexed that brilliant mind, surely crime would not have had the most immediate appeal unless there was another element yoked to it, which helped to create a greater motive. And there was, he says, that other element was justice. Hmm. You know, I'm I'm struck by this because I just heard a podcast over the weekend, and the speaker on the podcast, he was trying to create a 
uh, an upbringing for his son in particular, how to transition him from a boy to a man, how to teach him about some of the, the more important things. And one of the things he mentioned were the four virtues of the ancient world, uh, self-restraint, courage, justice, and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think about those four, and I think we see so much of them personified in Sherlock Holmes and in the Sherlock Holmes stories. And if, if you can sum it up in a way, um, I, I certainly don't hope to approach the artistry of John Donne, but when you think about those four virtues, we need restrained people in a world of excess. We need courageous people in a world of fear. We need wise people in a world of fools. And we need just people in a world of tyrants. Mm. And that's exactly what we get from Holmes. Mm. Oh, I love that. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful um, summary. And, it, you know, it's one of those reasons why the study of philosophy, but also the study of, you know, the ancient world, the ancient Greeks, the reasoning and ideas of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates... Are, are seem to be continually rediscovered, you know, with a with a cyclical nature, <laughs> kind of like Sherlock Holmes is sort of discovered every fifteen or twenty years by by the new generation. But there is a profound um, value here that just echoes down through the ages, and of course, David, um, you know, gets us off into this beautifully. It's lovely just to read his writing because he's it's so well written. You know, he says Holmes was all too aware of how the concept of justice in a just world fell short of the ideal in reality. Holmes many times bemoans the human condition, saying things like, you know, we reach, we grasp, and what is left at the end? A shadow, or worse than a shadow, misery from the retired colorman. And David says his detective abilities are aimed at easing this gloomy situation, righting wrongs where he can, and bringing justice to the world. And this is his raison d'etre. And, um, you know, now we will, we will get into um, exploring that. Well, let's get right into that right after this. Quick word from our sponsor. The Baker Street Journal was first published in 1946, and its old series extended through 1949. It picked up again in 1951 and has been publishing ceaselessly every quarter since then. Every issue of the BSJ is packed with top-notch papers, papers that reflect the sensibilities of Sherlockians from throughout the world. They might be scholarly in nature, giving us details on an aspect of Victorian life that maybe we weren't aware of. They might be tongue-in-cheek, that approach to the game where we wink at each other as we acknowledge Dr. Watson as the true author of the stories and try to figure out some inconsistency. Or they might be something that we never thought was related to Sherlock Holmes, and the author brings it all together for us. Whatever the approach, they're all represented in the Baker Street Journal. Plenty of varying opinions and researches on the world of Sherlock Holmes. Make sure you get on the subscription list to get your copy of the Baker Street Journal delivered to your mailbox every quarter by going to bakerstreetirregulars.com today. And just a reminder, after we finish our discussion here, we will be heading right into the drawing for a free back issue of the Baker Street Journal. So make sure you stay tuned for that. And if you're not already a Patreon supporter, here's your opportunity to get in line for the next time. Well, Bert, we were talking about getting into some examples of uh, Holmes bringing justice to his world and, and the metaphysical. Where, where does that leave us? It leaves us um, right here with a, with a whole list of things to refresh our memories and to enjoy recollecting. You know, I said at the outset, one of the lovely things about David's essay here is that he knits together so many of these various elements. And he points out that in Abbey Grange, in the Milverton case, in the Blue Carbuncle, in the Devil's Foot, and there are many more, Holmes operates outside man-made law in order that true justice can prevail. In the Abbey Grange, for example, 
He rolls out his own justice when he allows Captain Croker to go free, despite the fact that he's technically a murderer. I am the judge, Holmes says, and ignores the limited strictures of the law because Croker is essentially innocent. And there are cases where no crime has been committed. You know, for example, Mary Sutherland in A Case of Identity, Eugenia Ronda in A Lion's Mane. He helps heal the damage that's been done. And David points out that Holmes operates as the last court of appeal. His belief is not primarily in any kind of organized religion, but in developing and nurturing good within man. And David actually recollects uh, the reference inside of four to Winwood Reed's martyrdom of man. And in the closing pages of Sign of Four, uh, no, actually, in the closing pages of, of this book by Winwood Reed, the most remarkable ever penned, Holmes says in the Sign of Four, he quotes Reed, to be faithful to the intellect, to educate these powers which have been entrusted to our charge and to employ them in the service of humanity. That's all we can do. And it seems that Holmes is following that doctrine to the letter. It really does. Um, even in the, the Dancing Men, where he says, I'm very anxious that I should use the knowledge as I possess to ensure justice is done. You know, this was uh, his, his driving force, his raison d'etre. Uh, he's, he's and, and we have to remember that he's operating in an age, in, in the Victorian age, when uh, humanity was really trying to create order out of chaos. This is when science and the industrial age were really coming into their own, and we were seeing mankind for the very first time begin to take control over, uh, you know, natural occurrences or, you know, being really more uh, resourceful and reliant upon his own creations rather than on uh, the creations of nature. So it seems to me that seeking out justice in a disordered world at this time would be uh, very consistent with what <laughs> humanity was looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And David takes us through examples of Holmes' sensitivity to nature and his connections to the wider world by reminding us about Holmes' quote about the flowers, you know, in the Naval Treaty where he remarks that it's only the goodness, only goodness which gives extra, and we have much to hope from the flowers. And, of course, his reference in the Naval Treaty when he regards the innocence of youth as represented by the board schools, you know, capsules with hundreds of bright little seeds in each, out of which will spring the wiser, better England of the future. And, you know, David asks, so how is it that, based on all this evidence, we can accept Holmes as a brain without a heart, which is how Watson describes him in The Greek Interpreter? Well, you know, Watson is always quick to jump to conclusions, and he later amends or even contradicts many of them. And then in Three Garadebs, there's this lovely scene where where he sees for, for the first time the depth of Holmes' regard for him, and um, and you know, it's, this... it's worth it's worth uh, pausing on that for a moment when, when Watson is shot by Killer Evans in uh, the Adventure of the Three Garadebs, uh, Holmes he, he writes about Holmes and he talks about the depth of love and loyalty mm. which lay behind that cold mask for the one and only time. I caught a glimpse of a heart as well as of a great brain. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's amazing it took them <laughs> that long in their career for Holmes to express anything akin to uh, loyalty or love for Watson. Mm. Um, but, you know, again, he was, he, he was, he was a reasoner, uh, and, and I think his love of justice uh, certainly came out in a number of these stories that we've already mentioned. Uh, it was only at that moment of extreme danger that uh, he he expressed that love for Watson. And, and let's not forget that um, I think it was in uh, Charles Augustus Milverton where he said, I have some scruple in bringing you along tonight. Maybe that was Bruce Partington plans. One of the stories when they yes. were breaking and entering uh, where he was concerned about Watson and uh, in his pursuit of justice. 
And and I think Watson uh, reflected that in that case by saying, well, in that case, you know, uh, we, we've shared rooms together for many years. It would be fitting that we shared a cell together <laughs> if we were arrested. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, while the lesser emotions like romantic love were rejected by Holmes, his passion for justice in a better world was on a higher plane. He was like, says David, the metaphysical poets who expressed their desires whether it be for God or for a woman, through the methods that applied to the intellect. Holmes was aware that no man is an island, and he was determined to bring justice to those who'd fallen foul of scheming malefactors. He was the best and wisest of men, and it's no wonder that when he retired, he spent his time keeping bees, for the hive is the most ordered of society. Ah, there you go. Love that. Well, hey, why don't we get ourselves to the uh, drawing here, and then we can wrap up the show uh, nicely. Um, I, my goodness, I, I, I forgot. We, we had this in the office the other time from uh, the uh, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere drawing, the prize wheel. It's right behind me here. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to reach over and just give it a big spin. Okay. Randomly stopping on number number 10. And that looks like it belongs to uh, Donald During. <laughs> Donald, congratulations. We'll be getting you a copy of the back issue of the Baker Street Journal. So thank you for that. And just a reminder, if folks would like to become a patron, the link is right here in the show notes. Open it on the app that you're listening to us on, or simply go to patreon.com slash trifles. And I suppose, Bert, that that is, in fact, just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. What do you want? Justice. For whom? No, we are not partisan. We just want to see justice done, that is all.